Hello there. As a high school, uh, high school teacher uh, for the last 15 years, I've noticed a trend, and that is that my most successful students are the ones who are well-connected, who have healthy connections, strong connections, the most connections. Um, they're the ones who are more likely to have been raised in a family with, uh, with both parents, more likely to have siblings who care about them and love them and encourage them, challenge them a little bit, more likely to be involved in extracurricular activities or athletics, and sometimes they're just more likely to have a single connection with a good teacher. And the other side is true as well. The students who struggle the most tend to be the ones who are alone or isolated. They're the ones who don't have very many friends, who maybe have a rough family life, um, who maybe you know, resist those attempts of teachers to engage them. And these are just trends, of course, uh, but it's pretty obvious that students and young people benefit from human connections. And I've noticed a similar trend in my work as a chaplain with the National Guard. Um, my most successful soldiers are those who understand that they're part of something bigger, uh, that they're part of a team, uh, that they understand the chain of command, that they trust their leadership, and that they invest in the lives of the, their subordinates. They live out the Army values of loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. Um, and, they, and they find it important to, to, be, to make sure that they're belonging uh, into something that's bigger. And my soldiers who struggle more tend to be isolated. Uh, they tend to be looking more at what they can get out of the Army instead of what they, they can contribute to the Army. They're looking more interested in the benefits rather than the rewards. And again, these are just trends. Um, but what this means for my work as a teacher and as a chaplain um, it means that my job is to provide support and make those connections with those who need it. You know, I find those struggling, uh, struggling students and struggling soldiers and try to make those connections. And, um, and what I find is that it's a bit overwhelming because here's my problem. I have about 140 students a year. Multiply that by 15 years, that's almost 2,000 students that have worked their way through my classrooms. I'm in a National Guard brigade right now that has about 2,000 soldiers. I deployed with another 800 soldiers to the southern border you know, a couple years ago, and 600 soldiers to the Middle East a few years before that. I have about 1,300 contacts in my phone, and I know most of them. Now, some of you may be thinking that those are rookie numbers, right? I get it, there's a lot of well-connected people. But if you're more connected than that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There is no way that I can provide effective support for that many people. And so one of the things that I learned early on in my work as a chaplain and as a teacher, that in addition to making those connections myself, I also need to make sure that I help my students connect to each other and my soldiers to connect to each other. And that's really a big part of why I was so excited about this theme for this TEDx event about connectivity and the power of connectedness, because in my work, I've seen that day in and day out for years. Now, something else I've learned in my career is that sometimes connections aren't beneficial. Sometimes they can be dangerous. And if there is power in connectedness, we have to remember that power does involve danger. And one of the things that we need to, to remember is that just because something's dangerous doesn't mean that we can't turn it around and make something positive through it. And so what I'd like to do is, is use some examples from electrical connections, actually, to help us understand what some of these dangers are and maybe figure out some ways of what we can do to fix these problems with connections. Now, I am not an expert on electricity. Right? I had a ninth grade shop class you know, that taught me the basics, and then it was a long time before I actually tried to do some wiring myself, but eventually I did, and I started to, um, to mess with you know, changing some outlets or replacing ceiling fans. And so I've done my fair share of that, but I've also gotten my fair share of shocks because I didn't always know what I was doing. Now, my son is actually studying electrical engineering, and I've, I'm learning a lot from him. And one of the things that he's taught me is that all of the power lines and the uh, substations, they actually function at hundreds of thousands of volts, and that scares me. All right, it scares me for him. And, and he assures me that it's perfectly safe as long as you have the right training and tools and procedures. Right? 
Um, it's still a little bit too much, um, you know, and, and I know he also said that it's not the volts that kill you, it's the amps. Well, either way, I'm staying away from substations, all right? Um, but the, the important thing about this is that, um, that the benefit of electricity comes because electrical devices and circuits have been designed. They've been engineered. They have a, they have a purpose. Right. And so when we have a device that's designed to do something, it usually works. Now, of course, sometimes it doesn't. So let's look at a few examples. What happens when we'll walk into a room and we turn on the light switch, but nothing happens? Well, assuming that the power plant is producing the power, there is some sort of break in that connection. Right? There is a disconnect. Now, maybe it's something with the switch itself. Maybe it's the light socket has gotten dirty or corroded. Uh, maybe there's a break in a line somewhere. Maybe there's a, a circuit breaker that's been tripped. But there's something just not happening, right? So that's one, uh, one example. Now, in, in human terms, this is the student or the soldier or the person who just isn't connected to anyone else. They're alone. They're isolated. Um, they don't know, you know how to develop those relationships with people, right? Well, what happens uh, with, with another example? You take a, you take a device and you plug it in, and you turn it on, and there's too much power. All right, well, I learned about this when first time I went overseas. I tried to take a hair dryer that was designed for 110 volts, and I stuck it into 220 volts. Needless to say, I did not bring that hair dryer home with me. Right? And what happens when you take a, a household circuit that's designed for 15 amps, and you put about 50 or 60 amps worth of draw from it? Well, I hope you have a good homeowner's insurance policy because you're looking at a fire, right? Um, so we've got, these, we've got these potential dangers, and there's this other one that really hits home to me, and that's what happens when we're too connected to too many people, right? What happens when you take a, a battery-powered circuit, for example? You've got a battery, and it's powering one motor. It works just fine. And you add a second motor, and a third motor, 10 or 20 motors. Eventually, you get to the point where nothing happens. All right, it makes no difference. You turn the switch on, nothing happens because it's overconnected. And in a way, this makes me think of social media. Uh, this is what a lot of my students and soldiers deal with. They're so broadly connected to so many people that none of it makes any difference. They don't develop the relationships with any depth to make a change in their lives. And it's in the real world, too. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I had a student come up. She was struggling with some sort of personal, you know, uh, personal issue. And, and she's one of, those, one of those kids that seems to be well-connected. She appears to have a lot of friends. She you know, appears to um, you know, be talking in class way too much. Right? Uh, but she told me that she didn't have any friends. And I thought maybe she was exaggerating, but the more she talked, the more I understood that she was telling the truth. She was connected to a lot of people but without any depth. And so what do we do to fix these, um, these uh, connection problems? Well, first of all, if you're a person who doesn't have connections and you would like to have some connections, and guess what? This is pretty much everybody. You've got to say something. All right? You've got to let other people know that you need someone else. You need some sort of connection. You need a friend, right? And if someone ever tells you that, if someone ever comes up to you and says, hey, I'm, I'm lonely or I need a friend, be that for them. Even if it's just for a little bit. And even if it's the sort of thing where, you know, you take care of them in the moment and you provide the support and then you look for someone else to connect them with, right? And what happens if, you, um, if you're the person who, um, who's, who's connected too strongly, and you've got this, this history of burnout relationships because you've had too much energy, too much power going through. Well, and the first thing you've got to do is remember or you've got to recognize whether there's been damage done. You know, if you've got a history of failed relationships that have been too intense, too strong, too powerful, take a step back and figure out if you're okay. You know, look, at, uh, look at what you may need to heal from. And then secondly, as you develop new relationships, take it slow. Be patient. Recognize that no one other person is going to satisfy all of your needs. Right? Look at developing multiple relationships with people and not being so intense with any one given relationship. Don't expect too much of people. 
And what if you're the person that's spread too thin? Well, for those, per- those people, myself included, I'd actually suggest a, a, just a simple one, three, five model, right? Just for uh, some easy to remember numbers. One would be your soulmate, right? One and only one. You know, if you can find that special someone that you can do life with and invest in them and they're investing in you, that's fantastic, right? Limit that, you know, one special connection. My wife and I have been married for about 30 years, 30 years this summer. And uh, over the course of that time, you know, we've raised two adult sons, two sons to adulthood. We've lived in three different states, five different homes. We've survived two military deployments. We've worked a total of 12 full-time jobs between the two of us. Now, that's a lot of layers, right? That's a lot of time and a lot of uh, building of that relationship. And I tell you what, we're stronger now than ever. We're better now than ever because of the time that we've invested in developing that one relationship and being that soulmate with each other. And I understand that there's many of you who, um, who don't have that, um, who maybe did have it and it didn't work out, um, who thought you had it and it didn't work out. Um, maybe some of you aren't even interested in that, and that's okay. But as a chaplain, I want to encourage you that regardless of whether you spend life with a soulmate, you can always spend life with the one who made your soul. And the three is for your three musketeers. Everyone should have three people, right? Your three go-to people, um, all for one, one for all, the people that you know will answer the phone when you call, the people that you call them and... and, um, and check in on them and see how they're doing, as well as to have them call and check on you. People that you're going to actually invest in and be invested in. People that you would call to break you out of a foreign prison if you have to. Right? You've got to have those three people or four, right? And then the five. The five would be people that I would, I would suggest we should try to find people that we can invest intentionally in developing and building, supporting, and encouraging Five people, you know, from whatever part of our life that we need, um, that we can, you know, pour our life into them and make sure that they are succeeding as best as they can, uh, figuring out what they need, helping them make the connections that they need, uh, supporting, encouraging, all of that, but, but intentionally investing in someone else um, as well as having other people invest in you. And with the three and the five, it's important to remember that these people are going to change throughout the course of your life. I mean, my three best friends in high school are not the same three best friends that I had in college or the three best friends that I had in seminary. Right now, my three musketeers are, are members of the National Guard that I've served with, right? And my five come up from a variety of different places. You know, there's a couple of them at the school. There's a couple of them in the National Guard. Um, and so these people will change over time, but try to limit yourself so that you're not overconnected, All right? Now, there's one other thing that I've learned over the course of my career that, uh, that I want to share with you here at the end. And in a sense, it contradicts everything else I've said tonight. And that, that's that there really is no power whatsoever in connectedness. There's no power whatsoever in being connected. The connections are just a vehicle for power. Like an electrical device... It might be a fantastic device put together very carefully, very carefully designed, but unless there's some sort of power going into it, nothing's going to happen. And same thing with us as human beings. You know, we're fantastically and amazingly designed, but unless we're actually tapping into a source of power, other people, right, nothing's going to happen. And so... We also want to remember that that power can be constructive or destructive. All right, remember some of the dangers from electrical connections? We want to make sure that the people that we're connected with are receiving our best, that we're putting in positive power, positive energy into those connections, that we're demonstrating personal character, that we are sharing love and joy and peace Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And we're sharing these positive character qualities in a way that's going to help people instead of hurt people. 
And if we invest our time instead in sharing our anxiety and our bitterness and our anger, that's what those connections are going to reflect. And so in the end, I would encourage you to remember the purpose for which you're designed. And remember that your purpose is to channel power in a positive way for the benefit of others. And remember that our purpose is always something bigger than ourselves. Thank you very much.